everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Carolyn Talks. This is the podcast slash YouTube channel where I, your host, Carolyn Hines, speak to film creators about their work in the industry. And today I am joined by producer Katia Alexander to talk about her film, Pretty Problems, which premiered at the South by Southwest International Film Festival this year. And it won um, the Audience Award. So, and I watched the film and I thought it was quirky and interesting. So I can't wait to get into that. But as usual, I like to have my guests talk a bit about what got them involved in the industry. And I believe you're probably one of the few producers I've ever interviewed. So this is going to be a treat for me. So mm-hmm. um, Katia, can you talk a bit, what got, a bit about what got you involved in the film industry and what led to becoming a producer in particular? Um, well, I've always loved storytelling. That's always been such an important part of my life. Even when I was really, really little, I would always be telling stories and making stories up. And, um, and then when I was eight years old, I met this producer named Shauna Robertson. Um, she produced Superbad, Pineapple Express, Four Guild Virgin. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And um, I just looked up to her so much. And I was just like, wow, you know, you're so cool. And, and you make such cool stuff. Like, I, I want to, I, I want to be you. I want to be a producer. And then I grew up a little bit and I had other hobbies and other interests. And then when I was 16 years old, I... Um, at my at my high school you always have the choice between writing an essay or making a video and I almost always made a video Um, and my dad was like wow like these are really good you should you should study film like you should go to college for film and um, it got me remembering I was like oh yeah I do really I did always really want to be a producer (laughs) and so I uh, started working in the industry when I was 16 um, and working on sets. And, um, you know, I partially went to high school in high school and then I would do a lot of high school on the film sets. Um, And then by the time I was uh, 19, I was given my first feature to produce um, after producing 17 projects my uh, freshman and sophomore year of college. And all of like every single experience that I had just solidified for me how much I wanted to continue working in the industry and how much I loved it and all of my passion really lies in it. Mm. So what what was it what was it about producing in particular that was interesting to you because you said you made like student films and stuff but what was it that you said you know I don't want to be a director I don't want to be an actress I don't want to be a cinematographer or a writer, I want to produce these, I want to produce films, I want to produce stories. Mm-hmm. Well, when I was a bit younger, I was a bit of a performer, I played music, and um, I did ballet very, very seriously from the yeah. ages of 10 to 14. And so I did really like performing, but just, I had such crippling stage fright. Mm-hmm. And my parents at one point were like, you don't enjoy this. And I was like, I don't enjoy this at all. <laughs> <Very> <laughs> <Do funny. not. laughs> enjoy being on stage um and I just re- one of the main thing I loved about producing actually is um the fact that you hold so much power to make other people's lives better you know yes. if someone is out there dreaming to be an actress they've been dreaming to be an a- about an actor since they were very little I have the power to make that happen for them as well as filmmakers who have a script that they really, really want to be made, but they just don't really know how to do it. I get to do that. Um, And that was my favorite part of producing was just how much you can change people's lives for the better and have people's dreams come true. And that it just never gets old. It's such a good feeling to have people to hold some power to help people. Mm -hmm. Um, But then also as a person, I've always been extremely organized and extremely type A. And that's just such a rare quality in the creative industry. And so I always knew that it was a bit of my niche. It was something that I was very good at. And it was a unique skill I could bring to a very already active industry. Mm, you're like, I can I can do sp- uh, spreadsheets in a creative way. Like, yeah. there's, a way there's a way how to make Excel become creative. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. And for some people, I'm sorry, if I should have mentioned this before, but if you see me looking on it, just because I'm looking at my phone, I have my questions mm. in my phone. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So um, could you explain for some people what um, what producing is? Because I think a lot of, a lot of us don't really understand what produce. We, we kind of have like an abstract 
concept and idea of what producing is, but could you just mm-hmm. go a bit into the minutia of be, being a producer, like going from the beginning stages of, okay, so I have this project and this is how the steps that I'm going to take as a producer to make this film become reality. Um, so there's different types of producers, of course, um, but for the main producer and the type of producing I do, um, usually you are approached with a project that you might really like. The project might be at slightly different stages. Sometimes the project is completely ready to film. Um, and sometimes the project is just a script. It's just a script that someone has written and, and then all the different stages of that. But the first step is to package it. So you meet with all the creatives. Usually at that stage, there isn't even a director attached yet. It's just sort of mm-hmm. the writers and the other people that just want to make this sort of happen. And you start trying to figure out, okay, who who would be the best director for this and who has the right voice for this? And not only that, you know, you start thinking in some creative ways of like, have we men- have we heard anyone mentioning that they want to direct and they haven't directed yet and that we can maybe give them this chance and the story kind of aligns with what they're talking about. And then you start the casting process sometimes at the same time. And sometimes you wait for a director to come on board so that they have some say in the casting. Um, but you start, it's, you're constantly thinking about it in that way of just, is there an actor that fits this? Or is there an actor that's never played this role before, but we know that they've mentioned in interviews and whatever, that they want to play a role like this. And mm-hmm. could we offer this to them? And so it's about, having significant amounts of relationships between agents and managers and actors and other producers who've maybe worked with the people that you want to work with. And it's about kind of calling on those relationships, but then at the same time, they'll call you at some point and be like, Hey, I'm trying to get in touch with this person. You know them. Could you do that? And they're like, great. Um, And so it's a lot of teamwork that I love across multiple projects, across different producers, across different genres, which was my favorite part of it. And then once it's packaged and funded and you are ready to go, it's the producer's job to kind of steer the ship and make it happen and make creative choices about the project that might, you know, maybe a really perfect example is Pretty Problems. We literally didn't have enough beds to house people. And the original (laughs) script had like a full staff involved in the house. And we had to be like, we need to find a creative way to make there be two beds, two people. That's it. That's the whole staff. And so... But then it's also helping the creatives make the script better, you know, hosting table reads and offering notes and trying to help people make this project the best possible project. And on set, watching the dailies, making sure it's it's really coming together. And if it's not coming together, what types of choices can you make to make it come together? Maybe you can add some reshoot days. Maybe you can find ways to cut some scenes that aren't working. So how are you going to rewrite the rest of the script to sort of work with those ones that have been cut? And then in post-production, it's the same thing. It's watching the film a million times, giving feedback, hosting test screenings, and just trying to get the project from beginning to end and actually have it be finished. And sometimes people, everybody turns on the project at some point where they're like, I hate it now. It's a producer's job to never turn on the project and always Mm -hmm. be like, it's a work in progress. Keep molding the clay. Don't give up on this. Keep molding the clay and getting people to see the finish line through the fog that is filmmaking. See, so that's the thing. I don't think like even for myself and before I became involved with film criticism and like learning about the industry and I'm still learning about the industry is that I don't think a lot of people realize that the producer is very hands on. You know, I think a lot of us have this misconception that producers are just like, okay, we get the money, we get the funding, mm-hmm. and they're hand this baby over to the directors and to the writers. But from what you're mm-hmm. seeing and from what I've learned, like the producers are way more hands-on than a lot of people think. Like you're more yeah. like the instead of being the sous chef, the sous chef, you're the head chef in the kitchen. You're the <laughs> one who's getting making sure that all of the implements are there, the uh, all the ingredients for the recipe is there, and like. None of the assistant chefs, none of the waiters, the staff, you know, can't, this, the, the meal can't be delivered unless like the head chef is there. And like what you're describing is like, you producers are the, the head chef. Like even if, even if you have a director there, like it still can't happen without a producer because like if, if a director drops out or they're unable to like perform be, to, to fulfill their role for whatever reason, the producer is the one that's going to have to, okay, we, we need to find a replacement. We can't let, we can't just stop 
the the ship from sailing you know we need jess brown yeah. the captain you know so i think it's really interesting that you that your ex that you that you said and i'm glad that i asked because like still even like today i said many people don't really understand what producers is or we are i think like maybe i think and i'm gonna just like just be go straight on and say like for a lot of people who are like just super diehard fans of like actors or directors mm-hmm. they, they don't really they like a lot of the credit rightfully goes to the to the directors but like you kind of like miss all of the other people behind the scenes that bring these stories to life you know like yeah the director is amazing fantastic amazing fantastic cast but you can't have a film without a producer you can't have a film without a cinematographer you can't Mm -hmm. have a film without the set designers without all of the people who work on the crews to build these sets you can't have a film without the craft services because somebody got to feed the staff so no one falls so no one passes up from Mm -hmm. under you know, like it's all a very collaborative effort. And like for in the producer, like you, you're still like the director is in charge of all of that. You know, like you have to be there constantly to make sure like everything is being done the way it's supposed to be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know for me personally, I'm on set every single day. I don't miss a single day. Um, there are some producers, so an executive producer, sometimes executive producers are very hands-on and they want a creative role and they want to be there for everything. But more often than not, executive producers are what people think are producers who are sort of like, they get the money, they might help you package, and then they sort of are like, good luck, go on your way. <laughs> um, as well as like line producers is the other thing that people think producers do, which is like the spreadsheets and all that stuff. Line producers don't usually have a creative role <clears throat> at all. They're just hired for the project and they sort of keep everything on budget and, and stuff. And usually what I do is like a hybrid of both of like line producing because I am very organized and I do all that stuff, but I usually lead the project and um and it's, it's funny that you say that because um, about people not knowing what producers do. I remember when I was in college, they had me, because um, I, I was awarded my first feature while I was still in college, which was really wonderful. And they had me talk to some students, um, some of the freshmen and sophomores that were at the school. And I told everybody, I was like, how many people here are like, want to be a producer? And like, I think one person raised their hand. <laughs> and then I said, like, how many people here like, want to be a director? And everyone, everyone. Raised, everyone in the entire room. And then I said, who accepts the Academy Award for Best Picture? And there was like a silence. And I said, the producer. <laughs> and then I, I was like, now who wants to be a producer? So it was, it's like, I think that people do have like a misconception, but the relationship between the producer and the director is also extremely important because, you know, I'll hear what the director wants and I will try everything in my possible human power to make that happen. But sometimes it can't, and sometimes you have to then work with them and sort of not even compromise the vision because I think that implies that the film is going to end up worse. Mm -hmm. Every single time I come across something where I'm like, hey, this is an idea that you had and it can't happen. So let's come up with a better idea. Let's not even like be like, okay, what are we going to do instead? And like, let's sit down and spend the night to come up with something even better that's going to make the film better because we can't do this thing. Um, And I think that sometimes can be the hard part about being a producer is as everything is going wrong and things are coming up, you have to be the one that's like, actually, this is, this is a really good thing. <laughs> like the entire time where the people are, you know, sometimes freaking out and getting emotional and you have to be like, no, 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 this is, this is for the best. This is, this is better than, than what it would have been. Yeah. And I guess also like, it's also the, the job of the, of the producer to be able to just also say, this is a bad idea. We should not do this. You know, like, like, because like, you, there's also the going to say, this is amazing. I'll support you and do all this. But then I think it's also, and this is where I sometimes I think we're being like even myself as a critic or just like a fan of TV or a film. When we watch something, we say, and like, we like, yes, everything we see on the screen is ultimately the vision of the director and the writer. Mm-hmm. And like, when like, they do have responsibility for how things are, pre- are presented and like mm-hmm. how it's received and perceived. But then like, it's also kind of the, the responsibility of the producer to just be like, yeah, no, I think we, we, we're trying a, 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 a line here that we need to just like bring it back, you know, like they like their producers need to like hold on to the reins a bit tight and say, let me just rein you back in because you, you're just going a bit too far across where from where I want you to go. Yeah, and it, and it can often often make you sort of like the bad guy mm-hmm. of the situation because you are sometimes once being like this, it's mm-hmm. just not going to work. Like I'm telling you. Um, And I think, again, that is another reason why it's so important to have such a good relationship as a producer with your crew and with your director, because 
um, if you've established this really good relationship where A, when they've asked for something, you really have gone to the ends of the world to like make that happen. That way, if you're saying, hey, no, they're like, I trust you that it's, mm-hmm. that it's really a no. And I'm not going to go behind your back and try to figure it out myself. Like I trust you as well as when you're saying, well, you know, that's not a really good idea or, you know, this is how it could come across um, for them to know you're not doing it maliciously. You're not trying to like come from a place of ego of like my idea is better than your idea, but it's a real of like, I care about this project as much as you do. And we both want it to be really, really good. So that is why I'm saying these things. Mm, right. Yeah. And, and in saying all of that, could you talk about how you became involved with Pretty Problems? Because this film is, when I read the synopsis, I wasn't sure what to expect. And then when I w- watched the film, and then it, I'll even be honest, like 15, 20 minutes, I'm like, where's this film going? I don't <laughs> quite get it. But then at the end, I kind of like, I'm like, okay, so this film is actually talking about a- the excess and about about the excess of, of human of humans today. Like we want everyone wants to be famous, especially if they're into content production and everyone wants to be an influent, influencer. And everyone also has dreams and dreams that they want to pursue and dreams that they want help to bring to fruition, which is kind of like and if looking at and I'm here thinking about it, like the 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 one of the subplots of the, the story is how um Lindsay, she meets this woman and she this woman is basically saying, I'm gonna help all of your dreams come true. You know, mm-hmm. and like this character, wait, no, hold on, my bring back up the cast list because my phone turned off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> played by JJ Nolan. She's like, mm-hmm. I'm gonna be your benefactor. You know, mm-hmm. I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna give you all this money. I'm gonna give you all this support, and then you realize that, like, we as the audience see, like, she's full of nonsense. Like, you're not, you're not being genuine. You're just here blowing up hot air, and like, she gets off on telling people, I think you're amazing. But like, mm-hmm. you don't really think they're amazing. You just like, you just think they're amazing the way how they make you feel. And mm-hmm. so like, so can I, so I kind of like, as we were talking, I'm kind of like drawing parallels between the story and kind of like what you do as a producer, because there's another film that you also produce because I look at your IMDb, um, 8 Billion Angels, which kind of mm-hmm. also talks about access, uh, excess and mm-hmm. the human desire for more and wanting more. And then it's, it's mm-hmm. talking about, do, do we want more humans to want more? Or do we want less humans with more? And you know, mm-hmm. that's kind of like where humanity is kind of going on. Like everyone wants to be famous. Everyone wants to be rich. There's the hustle and the grind culture. And, mm-hmm. and then there's like, okay, so, and then it's like, if I don't pursue my dreams, does that mean that I'm not as worthy as the person next to me, which is one of the characters, Jack. That's kind of his, um, his kind of, his kind of, his story is kind of like that. He's thinking, he's like, he's surrounded by all these rich people. And even his wife is starting to take on this mentality where she's like thinking, you're not where I think you should be. So therefore you're not as worthy as the people that I'm comparing you to. So I want you to, uh, I went on a bit long for that, but we'll get into that. But first talk about how you became involved with the um, production of Pretty Problems. And what was it about the story that drew to it? So um, the way I like physically got involved, just in the way that the universe just collides, you know, um, or collaborates is I, I was working at the studio um, when I first moved to Los Angeles that I had gotten in touch with who was actually, I got in touch with them through the same people that I made Eight Billion Angels with. So it was just mm. really funny how it worked out. And it was a comedy studio and that's where I met Michael. And then um, I left the studio because the stuff I was working on was kind of coming to a close. So I just moved on to my next thing. And then COVID happened. <laughs> um, oh, and COVID. <laughs> um, Michael, my father had randomly met Michael and was like, you should talk to my daughter. And we both were like, we know each other. Um, mm. And so we started talking again and he sent me these seven scripts. I think it was of all the projects that were on his slate that he like wanted to make. And um, I read them all and I read pretty problems and was like, this is, this is unbelievable. Um, and through that, there was another script on the slate called um, A Mirror Conception, which is now called uh, Mirror Game, mm-hmm. A Mirror Game. And Michael and I did that film together. It did really, it, the production of it did very, very well. It's still in festivals right now and it's doing very well in festivals. It's winning a lot of awards. We're very excited about it. Very different tone of pretty Pro- than Pretty Problems. It's very serious drama, you know, one location, very focused film or like pretty problems we call it you know wonderland like it's just you know it's crazy and so um complete opposites but 
the whole time of making Mirror Game, as much as I loved the film and was so excited about it, I just kept going up to Michael being like, so what about Pretty Problems? What's happening with Pretty Problems? At the end of filming, he was like, I really want you to produce Pretty Problems. You know, that went well. I think you should do it. And uh, so the thing that drew me to the script so much was, A, it was just so realistic um a lot of people keep asking us how much of the film's improv like was the whole movie just improv because it feels very conversational it's very the timing mm -hmm. of everything and we did improv a lot on set I will admit that but of what made it into the actual film was pretty much all scripted mm -hmm. um and so it was just that's just how it was written like when I read it I really felt like real conversations were happening on this page as well as I loved how complicated it was. Um, I think that so many times when um, I read these types of scripts, which honestly is a valid view as well, um, which is just like rich people are pure evil and they just want everybody to hunt each other for sport. And that is all rich people on the planet forever. And everybody else is just hunting each other for sport. And um I think that that is a pretty valid view because I think that there are some people that are like that, but it's just not true for everyone. And um, Michael and I working in the film industry and stuff, we do spend a lot of time with very eccentric, wealthy people. And we sort of were like, how, how do we tell this honestly? Because they're not always great people, but they're not pure evil either. There's a, there's a kind of a gray area and um, between Kat and Matt, like one of the things I really found so interesting about the characters was this sense of like forced intimacy, you know, mm -hmm. within, within five minutes of meeting Jack, Matt is telling him that his father committed suicide in prison for doing insider trading and that his yeah, mom was telling me these things. Yeah. yeah. And it sort of is like, what, <laughs> you know, and it's same thing with Kat. She's sort of being like, you're amazing. You're perfect. You should come away with me to for this weekend we should start a business together like but what's really happening for me in these what I was seeing in these characters and what I've seen in real life is the reality of it is that they just don't have friends and mm -hmm. they don't have intimate relationships and they don't know how to have intimate relationships so instead they're just kind of forcing all this stuff to feel intimacy with other people because ultimately that's that is the most important thing in life is to have community yeah. and have love in your life Whereas Lindsay and Jack do have this really beautiful marriage, but then once they start kind of comparing their love for each other with instead just this massive amounts of wealth, Lindsay is starting to be like, actually, I would rather have the wealth because she's thinking, well, these people have no problems. They're just so happy where Jack's kind of staying grounded the whole time and being like, what are you talking about? They have no friends. They don't love each other. They're alcoholics. Like, what are you talking about? They have so many problems. And so now they're like, marriage is struggling and they're trying to work through this together. And like, will their love prevail? Um, and I, I just, I just found that so interesting because it felt, it felt like a realer take on the situation, which is more so about loneliness and relationships and lack of community and, lack of love in your life and what does that do to a person mm, exactly because I'll, I'll be honest like when I when I first got the um my, my the editor not editor the publicist that I that I communicate with regularly she she sent me the the trailer and she's like would you like to interview the producer I was like first and I'm like sure and I was like hesitant because I'm like this is a film about a whole bunch of rich white people I'm like how will I relate to this and this, and again this is one of my favorite things about film is that you can watch a film about people from a completely different race with completely di different um, social and economic um, demographic and still find something relatable and this is what I think I one thing I really like about this film is that it's, it's offbeat for one. Like the tone isn't very specific. You're, 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 it's like a comedy, but then it's also kind of like a bit of a romance because it's talking about the relationship between Lindsay and Jack. But then it's a bit of a horror too because when it starts out, I was like, is this a horror? And Jack was me. I'm like, Jack, I'm like, Jack is a white man, but I'm like, Jack, you are me and I am you because Jack was like, this feels like a bad idea. Jack was like, is this a horror movie? He's like, are we driving to our deaths right now? And I'm like, yes, Jack. I'm like, you love Lindsay. Lindsay is your wife. But you know what? Love is, well, love is like, like, we all got to die sometimes. I'm like, you got to die with her. Because he's like, this is a murder house. I'm like, yes, Jack. This is a murder house. What are you doing? Turn the car around and drive back. And even right on almost to the end of the film, I was just thinking, is someone going to jump up with a machete and start <laughs> 
And I thought it was going to be Kat because she gives like crazy energy. But oh, yeah. <laughs> she was like, like, you know, Kat, you got some things. I'm like, you give like crazy lady energy. Like, I don't want you to ever leave my house. I will keep you like, I'll keep your skills <laughs> yes. and company energy. <laughs> yeah, she does. And I think that that it comes from like this extreme desperation for her where she just she just needs a friend so mm-hmm. badly, but she has no idea how to be real with someone and how to be honest with someone. Um, it's actually funny that you say that because we obviously filmed on the property and um, I, all the emails I sent to the cast and crew, I was like, okay, guys, here's the deal. You know, we did name it murder house. We, we're not murdering you. Uh, please, please do show up. Um, no, there is no self service. You'll be fine. We, we won't murder you. And Wait, there really uh, wasn't any self service. Yeah. Oh, that was real. Yeah. That was really hard. As no, the see, mm. <laughs> there was like, one or two areas that like kind of got service and stuff and there was wi-fi but i mean there's a whole crew so wi-fi didn't work very well because it's like 40 of us are attached to it i mean it was yeah we were definitely really cut off genuinely from the world when we were there on this compound but i had to send multiple emails because i also didn't know some of the crew members i sent multiple emails being like every email ended with we are not murdering you i promise we are making a movie we are not murdering you please show up to the first day of shooting <laughs> no, i should be like you know what i'm like do i really need to like boost my career acting this film because i can just die in the process yeah. like, no. let's not become a hollywood um urban legend <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um, so can you just talk a bit about just like watching how the um the cast and story unfolds because as you said you as a producer you're there for you it personally you're always there on set and you're always there like i'm giving like your own notes and observations so like was there anything during the filming where you were just like thinking you know what this is like hysterical but then you also thought you know what? this is very much like my, my like my life because there's certain situations like the like the, the the conversations that um where to me like i said jack is kind of like me because jack is the person where you know we we think in our daily lives like I will never be this person I will not be the statistic mm-hmm. in this situation and then you actually end up in the situation you're just like how did I get here you know mm-hmm. and you're like like what am I doing around these people so like were there any moments where you're just like you know what this is like right, too much a bit like real life for me to 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 be able to like, understand right now <laughs> um. Yeah, well, I think w- one of the things that we were doing, this is more of the fun side of it, was um, on our days off, we, we really did throw these huge parties on these mm-hmm. on this property. I mean, just with the cast and crew, but still, I mean, they were incredibly elaborate and <laughs> required many people's participation to plan. But all the parties mirrored the actual parties that we were filming <laughs> in the movie. And so, um, like, we had a karaoke party and we had, like, you know, a party in that room with all the lights. We had a party in the fire farmhouse we had all these like we had a party our final party was the party in the barn we didn't even like take the lighting down we just Mm. kept everything set dressed and hold the lights up and then like threw a party in the barn um so that part was really fun because we would like watch ourselves film the party and then we would then experience the party and we're like yeah this party is actually pretty cool um but there was a lot of uh there was so much realism of just like, oh, I, I know this person. And I think for me, I was really inspired by it because what ended up happening every single night after we were shooting, we would sit around the table and we would talk about the script and we would try to find little things in it. Like maybe we should change something. Maybe we found a thread through filming that we should add and stuff like that. And so um, because I felt like I knew these people in real life, it was easy for me to be like, this is why this person is making these choices. It's, it's because of this, because I know the real person and that is why they're making these choices. Um, and then also while filming, I personally trusted the process the entire time. Um, I will say that I'm not always that person. I am sometimes the one that's like, I don't know if this is going very well, but for pretty problems, I really trusted it the entire time. I was like, this is, this is how I visioned it. This is, this is going well. And I was really glad that I had that because um, we spent the first two days filming all the bedroom scenes, which are the serious scenes of the movie. They're the scenes that kind of ground the film where Jack and Lindsay are alone talking about the craziness that's happening. We filmed them all at once. And so you know, 
Michael and Britt kept coming up to me and being like, I, I, you know, I think that, I think this is too serious. Like this is supposed to be a comedy. Like we've cried three scenes in a row. Like this is, this is getting really serious. And I was like, no, trust me. This is, this is it. I promise you, this is the movie. We, we got it. Um, especially because I was watching, I had the privilege of having time to watch the dailies. And I was processing a lot of the dailies because we didn't have the hands to do everything. So I did a lot of the DIT stuff. And so I was watching all of the footage and I could see that we were getting it. We were getting the movie. And then when we started, the rest of the crew, uh, cast came to the house and we started filming the rest of the scenes. Then Michael co coming to me and being like, I think we're making American pie. I don't want to make American pie. Like this is, <laughs> this is a problem. And I'd be like, no, to trust the process. We are getting the movie. We are capturing the movie. And, um, and it wasn't until we saw you know, it wasn't even the first cut. It was like a couple cuts in mm -hmm. that all of a sudden Michael and Britt were like, you're right, we got the movie. Like, this is good. This is coming together. And I was like, I knew it. Like, I knew that we got the movie. Mm. So that's the, that's the other thing that you have to... You have to stay confident in the vision, even while other people, even while other people, including even the director, maybe even the cast is like, I'm not sure about this. You're like, you're, you're the one who has, to be, who has to be like, trust the process. Or, you know, mm -hmm. even remind themselves to like, trust yourself, like you, you know what you're doing. This is, and that you're doing the, the, the that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're doing mm -hmm. what gets the story and the message across. And uh, so like, you're also kind of like the cheerleader, <laughs> you know, yeah. you're like the therapist and you're just like, guys, trust me, trust yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes you're not getting it <laughs> yeah but you, you have, have to have fake like, it to make it <laughs> yeah exactly and sometimes you have to be like no it's coming together and then in post you're just like in the background being like okay here are all my solutions to all the problems that <laughs> are like popping yeah, up yeah. here's what I think we're going to do in post to fix all this yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> Yeah. So um, as I, at the beginning, I kind of mentioned um, another film, um, Eight Million Angels. So I want to mm -hmm. talk a bit now about how that film is kind of like similar to uh, Pretty Problems in the fact that they both talk about human excess and wealth and greed mm -hmm. and all of these things, but from two completely different perspectives. For you as a producer, um, working on these types of projects, and like you even mentioned that Mirror Games, which is more serious, but even that one talks about relationships too. Mm -hmm. Do you have a philosophy as a as a, as a producer where you say these are the these particular types of stories doesn't matter what genre they are but they also have they all have to have some kind of commonality or messaging that you're saying this is the type of story that I want to that I want to be involved in with telling um for me it's about like I'll never make a project that I don't agree with morally I think and um a lot of my morals revolve around people um I mean my whole view of life is a make life as good as you possibly can for everyone that you possibly can make it good for. And I think for Apolline Angels, that was like a major thing of, you know, there are so many people, like a third of the world lives in abject poverty. And already the earth is where it's at right now in terms of uh, global warming. And a lot of the projections that people have of solving global warming implies that the people in abject poverty will remain in abject poverty. And I don't think that's okay. I think that all of our solutions should also revolve around making people's lives better. And so for Apolline Angels, that film is definitely very controversial because it was about overpopulation but it was about overpopulation under the lens of the only solution to those things are allowing women to have education, have access to birth control, have access to healthcare, be allowed to have the matriarchal of the family planning the family instead of the patriarchal. If a woman only wants to have one kid, she should be allowed to make that choice for herself. Um, and a lot of the things that people were finding were a lot of women didn't want to have nine to 10 children, but felt forced to, or didn't have the tools not to. And also people, when we talk about that, always thought that we were talking about other countries and we're like, no, we're talking about America right now. And people just are always so blinded to that thing. Even in the documentary, we had like this whole line being talking about that and being like, we're not talking about Africa, by the way we're talking about America. Mm -hmm. um, and so that film is important to me because it's just about women having power over their lives and over their educations and over their careers and over their bodies and how important that is and how 
much problems are so interlaced with each other that the fact that women don't have those things, even in America. Um, now that's one of the reasons we also have climate change and global warming. They're all kind of connected to each other. And when you solve some problems, other problems are solved too. And my other whole thought about it is, okay, maybe that's not the solution to global warming, but wouldn't it be great to implement anyway? You know, what? why don't we just give women rights anyway? And then if it doesn't fix global warming, that's fine. But now women have rights, you know? Um, and I think it goes in with uh, Pretty Problems and Mirror Game as well, because for me, the most important thing in the world is people, your connections with people, the connections you can make with your friends and your families and your loved ones and the community that you can build, as well as knowing that your actions affect everybody on the planet. We all are sort of on this planet together. And so I just think that there should be a mental global shift of focusing on community and the people in your life and the people around you instead of excess wealth and power and those types of things, which, I mean, ultimately they're, they're not going to solve your problems in your life. If anything, they're going to add significantly more problems to your life because you're now ignoring your problems and creating all these other complications. Um, and the thing I loved about Pretty Problems was that it is a comedy. And I feel like that message is almost clearer in a comedy sense because, you know, people are kind of letting down their guard and they're not sitting there thinking I'm about to watch like this really intense documentary that's going to like call me out on all my stuff it's more so people are sitting and they're laughing and all of a sudden they're like oh yeah like these cat is crazy she's a crazy woman and I should not want to be her um yeah no it's true because um as I was watching the film like I mentioned um I mentioned the cat is she 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 has her issues but then there's also her husband and I think the film does a pretty good job of balancing the view of making sure that both the men and the women get called out equally. And mm -hmm. um, and like for Kat's um, husband, who is Matt, played by Graham Outbridge, he he's an interesting character because the way how he he he's very similar to Kat in the fact that he's trying to create these um kind of like surface level intimate relationships and he's trying to do it quickly, but he does it very differently because the way how men use humor is very different to women and how men ingratiate themselves to each other. Is very different to how women do it with with each other, and in this case, like he's um he's 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 kind of off balancing Matt, where he's trying to do the whole dominant alpha male thing, but in a very subtle way, and mm -hmm. he does it by trying to, he does it by doing that you know that uh, self deprecating uh, fat way of telling jokes or of describing themselves like oh yeah I'm a millionaire but you know I still have problems mm -hmm. like sir I am broke you can't come and tell me nothing about having problems when you are a billionaire you know mm -hmm. and then like he's being he's super invasive with Matt because he talks about evading Matt's privacy looking at his um his his um history looking looking up his uh, financials and all of this stuff and he offsets Matt from being rightfully upset about that by saying, oh, but, you know, I'm a billionaire. So, you know, I got to be careful with who I bring around mm -hmm. me. And, you, know, you are you, you, you you're literally admitting to committing crimes because that's an invasion of privacy. You just committed mm -hmm. like two different felonies and like you're laughing it off by making Matt feel like, oh, he's being um, he's overthinking things by being worried. And like Kat kind of like does the same thing, too, because he tells Kat, and he tells Lindsay, he's like, you guys are in super invasive. And then Lindsay, instead of backing her husband, say, but of course they have to do this. I'm like, what are you doing? So I like that the fact kind of I like that the film kind of shows the male and the female perspective of that. And but then it um another thing that I think it does, um I think very subtly you talked about how it's discussing things about like gender and stuff it it does show like how men view wealth differently to women mm -hmm. you know for, for it, it, it does I think in a very smart way yeah thank you I think I think a lot of that was the fact that you know we had Michael but then we also had Brit and so Michael was definitely the main writer of the film he's when like sat down and wrote the script but he got Brit involved back when he only had 10 pages of the script written and sort of a vague outline. And they worked together to figure out, okay, like what experiences can we put these people through? How do we push their buttons? How do we sort of break them? Um, but I also think it adds to this level of um, the female conversations and relationships 
feel very, very true to the female experience, as well as the male conversations and the male relationships feel very, very true to the male experience experiences. And it's because we had a man and a woman sort of working on this project together at the same time and putting in both of their own experiences, their own relationships and being both very vulnerable with each other and very vulnerable with the script. Um, and I think that that is why it so accurately portrays sort of their, those both very, very different things. And I, and I do find it really funny about what you're saying about Matt with his sort of alphaness. And I, I think it's totally true. And I think Jack is the only one that's sort of picking up on it throughout the film where he's saying like, no, they're making fun of us. They don't like us. They're making fun of us. And Lindsay's like, she just doesn't want to believe it. She's like, no, no, no. They, they love us. They support us. They're going to fund our company. And he's like, no, no they're not. <laughs> We're a game. Exactly. It's kind of like, it is a game to them. And like you mentioned before um, about how there, there's films when it talks about what it's about um, a lot of films these days and even TV shows are about the rich hunting the poor you know, using the poor for sport. And I'm like, the mm -hmm. film kind of, like, that story is kind of like that from, but from more of a um, bourgeoisie kind of like um, a more bourgeois perspective and, mm -hmm. and more, you know, because like they are hunting mm -hmm. the poor and using them for their entertainment. And like, but Kat does it by going into like, um, by into going into, because I get the feeling that she did this before to other women, like, you know, mm -hmm. going to like clothing stores or jewelry stores and look for the, the shop assistants and, the, and she's like, I'm going to bring, I'm going to boost up your morale. I'm going to tell you that you're beautiful, which they are, but she's not doing it to like be genuinely nice and like, to, mm -hmm. to be genuinely and, and supportive and encouraging. She's doing it to like lower their guard. You know, she's yeah. like slowly, very subtly baiting them. And she is, and she's like, I'm going to bring you into my circle, not because I want to bring you into my circle to be a part of it. I'm going to bring you into my circle to make you feel better about yourself. You know, which is where yeah. again, the film it treads very closely to, to potentially being a horror. Like, change a couple <laughs> of things that this could work very well as a horror. Well, the original script was a little bit more horror. There was like, um, there were a lot more scenes where, like, you know, there was a scene where Jack is running through the vineyard and there's like demonic dogs and stuff chasing him, and the rabbit comes up a lot more. And we we did eventually cut that because people were like wow, you know, this, this script really scared me. And we were like, it's a comedy. And they were like, okay, we should probably cut all the horror out of this. Um, and Because it did used to also be called Pretty Problems in parentheses Murder House. And so we were like, okay, let's, let's like stick to one of these things. Um, but like one of, one of my favorite parts of the film that was just felt so real to me is when Kat sort of is announcing like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start a store with Lindsay. And Lindsay is immediately like, Oh, oh my God, like this is this is amazing. And and then the second everybody stops applauding, Lindsay's like, okay, great. So what what are we gonna do? Are we gonna do a store? And she's like, mm, I don't know, we're gonna go to wine tasting. You know, she just doesn't, she doesn't really care. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're like Lindsay to her, it would be her whole life, it'd be changing her life. So of course she's like hanging on every word. She's like, Oh my god, is this like really gonna happen? And and for Kat is sort of like, eh, I don't know. I started four companies last week, you know, none of them exist now. Like, we'll we'll see. We'll see how this yeah, one goes, like, you it's know. Like, it's a game for her, it's a game. And mm -hmm. um, so and also so pre so the thing about um what's I saying? <laughs> All right, okay. So I talked a bit about how you like doing these kind of films, but um, as you said, you have a philosophy and it's mainly about speaking to, with regards to like women's rights, and you mentioned um about how like even in 8 billion angels, it's about even if what what we want to happen doesn't necessarily happen with regards to equality and equity of wealth and that kind of stuff, we know that's not gonna happen because the rich hold on to their, to their wealth extremely tight and they're not about sharing that with anyone. Um, but that you talked about how like it, 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 it should always, like everything should still come down to, how about just giving women the 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 rights that we are that we deserve just as being humans just by existing you know just right to proper health care right to contraception right to the, the having power over our own bodies um, physically as well as um, medically and politically you know yeah. so for you as a as a producer and as a female producer in the industry like how has being a producer helped you to navigate this space because I, I imagine that just being a woman like you had would have had many roadblocks and you would have met a lot of people who were saying you know what you don't really because even though a lot of people like to think that we're in 2022 like the world is super progressive and Hollywood is progressive we we know it's not really that it's still very patriarchal it's still very male centered so for you like how being a producer helps you to navigate the industry and the world as a woman but then also how does 
how does being a woman and a producer help you to navigate being in the film industry, but then also give you a sensibility with how you look at films? Um, yeah, being, being a woman, especially being a producer, it can be very hard. Like a story that I tell all the time is one time I was on a set and just a random crew member, I honestly don't even know what he was doing on the set. He was probably a grip. He like, comes up to me and starts telling me like this very detailed description of like how I should be keeping the milk cold for the coffee. And I eventually went, oh, I don't work for, I'm not a PA. I don't work for crafties. And he was like, and then I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a producer. And then he just doubled down and went, well, everyone should know how to keep milk cold. And then walked away. <laughs> Do you like, then? Do you know? <laughs> um, and so that type of stuff happens a lot or I'll say something and and nobody listens and um it can be incredibly incredibly frustrating or even just being trusted with projects or being trusted in any way and I think the industry is definitely still a boy's world and um there's been many experiences in my life where just a lot of the men in the industry that I know, like they'll go on a boy's trip to Hawaii or they'll go on like a boy's trip to Las Vegas. And I'll be like, I mean, you guys are my friends. You're my peers. We make projects together. Why would I not be invited to these? And they're like, well, it's the boy's trip. But what's really happening on these trips is they're planning projects. They're sharing contacts. They're doing all these things. And the amount of projects I've seen come out of these boys trips, I'm now not a part of because I wasn't even invited on the trip. And I think that people don't see those subtleties of how that stuff can affect your career and it can affect your relationships with people where it's sort of, you know, people are thinking, oh, it's just in the job interview. It's like when you're at the job interview, people are turning you down, which can happen. But it's also in all these little subtle ways of, you know, no one has ever invited me to play golf ever in my entire career. And um, so many deals in the film industry are made on the golf course or, you know, in all these different places that I'm just not really invited and I, I just don't really get to go. But on the other side, I'm the producer. So I get to choose who is on the set. I get to choose who is going to be casted in these things to a certain extent. I mean, sometimes I definitely get overruled, but I can keep putting my foot down and trying very, very hard. And with Pretty Problems, uh, it was an entirely female, uh, it was an almost entirely female cast or a, a crew, both above the line and below the line. And there were so many times on the film, I had the, the realization, you know, there was a couple things that went wrong, like camera broke and all this stuff. And we would gather in a room to try to figure out, okay, what are we going to do? Who are we going to call? How are we going to solve this? And I'd look around the room and be like, oh my God, it's all women. <laughs> There's not a man in this room. And it felt really good because I felt very heard. And um, I think that there were so many times where we could, you know, talk to each other in these very specific ways that were just very made me feel very comfortable it was I guess like in a sense like there was less like code switching really because we sort of it was all women we were all together it wasn't like okay well now we're entering the boys club so now we got to act like them we could just kind of act like ourselves and I was talking to some of the camera people on that shoot as well um, we were talking about how I when I first started working in the industry I tried to dress like in a very masculine way um, and then when I was like 22 or 23, I was like, you know what? No, I'm going to dress how I want. And I started wearing like really intense dresses and all this stuff on set. And people would be like, wow, you're like really going to wear that. Like, how, how can you help out? And I was like, um, yeah, I can, I can lift some things in a dress. Like it's, this isn't going to be like a, an insane thing. But sort of realizing that even like how I'm presenting myself on set and being authentic to myself that was really important to me and on pretty problems because it was mostly female. It didn't feel like an extra step to do that. It felt very natural because mm -hmm. of all the people that were there. And so I think that um, it was a realization I only had very recently because I felt very powerless in this industry for a long time where I was like, well, I'm just at the whim of whoever, you know, wants me to produce their movie and that's going to happen. And, no, I am in a unique experience where I can say, no, I, I don't like that project. It doesn't align with anything I believe in, or I'm not going to do this if you're not going to hire these people, or if you're not going to represent these people, I'm just not going to do it. And people will listen and be like, okay, great. Then we'll represent those people and we'll hire those people. And so it takes a while to get there and you have to kind of 
go through a lot of um, BS to kind of get there, but it is really worth it because then when you're sort of the boss, you get to kind of choose who has a seat at the table and who has a voice in the room. And I think it's very important that some people with certain worldviews don't, uh, they shouldn't have a seat at the table. They shouldn't be the leading voice in the conversation. And there are so many people that have so many important things to say that don't have the access to have had a certain career that could get them certain jobs. And I'm trying to dedicate myself to trying to give those people a voice as much as possible. Hmm. I, so I, I think it would behoove me to, I have to ask about asking, about getting, you talk about bringing people to the tables. What about um, advocating for like, women of color in particular? Because we know that Hollywood is so much more, is it's so much more harder for women, yes, but definitely women of color to get not only seats at the table, but to just even get in the room to be able to get a seat, you know, because they, they, we, we see so much projects and like you talk about these, and what you're saying about the men um, going to the golf course and like, using the analogy of seat at the table, like this is something that is said so often these days. And it's something I've been thinking about recently where we talk about, oh, getting a seat at the table. But as we mentioned, so many of these, these, these films and so many projects and so many deals are made away from the table. They're not even mm-hmm. made at the table. They're made like on the golf course. They're, they're made on yachts, you know, they're made at lunch, you know, yeah. they're made in some, in some, some bar being like super hyperbolic, but you know, some bar, some bar filled with cigar smoke. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and a snifter brandy but like but like they that's how they block out women and women of color from getting opportunities because like those places are already as exclusive only to white men in particular like that's how they are able to block everyone else from getting assets because they they don't even give they don't even make the decisions in the places that we think they occur you know they already mm-hmm. occur in places where like everyone else is excluded yeah so for Pretty Problems in particular, there were versions of the script that included people of color. And mm-hmm. we had a lot of conversations about how we shouldn't be calling out. So here was like the major thing we were saying, okay, for Brit's character, Lindsay, it changes the story completely. If it's yeah, a person if she's of a woman color. of color, or, yeah, it would be different. Yeah. Same thing with if Kat, if Kat was a woman of color, it just completely changes the story. And we didn't want to paint that in a bad light and we didn't want to sort of call that out. We were like, this is a film to call out white people on being crappy. And so we tried to find diversity where we could. Behind the scenes, there was a significant amount of diversity. We got awarded the reframe stamp by Sundance. They only award about 20, 26 of those a year. And you need to have not just female representation, but representation of people of color. And so we had behind the scenes, we had a significant amount of representation. And, um, and then we hired Vanessa as well, because it was like the one character that we knew, okay, it doesn't, this benefits the story that she is a black woman. And also Vanessa is like, the light of my life. And I love her so much. And she's already cast in every project I'm ever gonna do. Um, And so for that specific story, it was a conversation that we had for an extremely long time. Um, And this was the decision that we made. We thought that for this story, it is, it is a story about calling out white people and white people calling out white people. But moving forward, that's not true for all stories. And if it was true for all stories, then those probably aren't the stories that we should be telling. We should be telling other stories. So moving forward, now that there is room for that within the movies with everything. It's something that I've been fighting tooth and nail for. I absolutely won't sign on to a project if the cast is entirely white or if it is just a white story, because I kind of honestly just find that boring. I don't think that that's interesting at all. I think that that's what media has looked like for 200 years. And it's been done before. We've all done it. It's time to move on and to kind of change. And so I completely agree with you. And it's something that is extremely important to me. Yeah, no, I agree with you about if the if you had added um, the, any of the cast were people of color apart from Vanessa, the context of a lot of the scenes and the overall plot would be completely different. And mm-hmm. and I, there there is a way to make another film 
uh, that that would touch on those stories but this film in particular for pretty problems it does like that to me that makes sense and i but you mentioned vanessa and i know we have to wrap this soon because i was told we only had a specific amount of time but you mm-hmm. mentioned vanessa and her, her character actually made me laugh and there's a lot of scenes in this film that made me laugh and i had to ask you there's some references to some spice girl songs and it was like <laughs> yes and it was, I, had, I was like i must ask her about this about these references and about vanessa's characters yeah. can you talk a bit about that yeah, so we were sort of taught, we were talking about like sort of the sometimes, you know, some of the shamans and stuff in Los Angeles and how they, so, so many of them, they're just so fake and everything. And, and we were kind of talking about Vanessa. I mean, one of my favorite moments for her is like she, when she kind of gives her speech and it is just mm. an accumulation of song lyrics from many different songs. And yeah, yeah. Jack and Lindsay are the only two that are like catching on. Like with every yeah, other yeah. line that she says, they're both like, this is they're like yeah and um but then at the end of her speech she goes right right and then she does this look that is just like i hate these white people and then like kind of carries on (laughs) i'm only here to get paid (laughs) yeah and so i just was like she is the perfect person for this role and she was amazing and honestly that character is a lot like her she is so like funny and out there and crazy and like I said, she was my favorite person on set and, uh, and, uh, and she's my favorite character in the film. And so, um, yeah, that was, I, I think like the whole thing of it was just like, okay, like if these rich white people are just going to like kind of pay me to like sort of mix up some, some cocoa mix and water oh, and say like some song chocolates. lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, call it cacao. I mean, <laughs> I mean, why not? Why, why would I? Why would I say no? And yeah. so that was like something that we were trying to kind of get across of like, they, they these people, these wealth people are so out of touch and they're so ununderstanding of what humanity is that like they genuinely think that song lyrics is like a spiritual awakening for them. But some song lyrics, song lyrics can be a spiritual right, awakening. They can be. Like the Spice Girls. Like, the that was, Spice like, Girls. The last thing I was <laughs> expecting to hear. It was like, that's, like, that's two become one. I'm like, that's want to be. And it was, it was like, that was always also like, this film is definitely for the, for the, um, what are we, millennials or Gen Z? I still don't know what we are. I was born in <laughs> yeah. But I was like, yes, this is this, this particular, a lot of these scenes are definitely for people from my, from my age demographic because mm-hmm. we get the references. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I remember when I showed the film to friends for the first time when we got to that scene, they both started being like, wait a second right when Jack and Lindsay are doing that. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Those are songs. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, this is the best. I was like, you talked about the karaoke party. Like, the kar- there's nothing better than a karaoke party. I miss karaoke. I haven't been to karaoke since the pandemic. I need to go back. But- oh, I love karaoke. <laughs> Big fan. It's the best. It's like the best form of entertainment ever. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Kathy, for taking the time to speak with me. This was um, really illuminating. And I got to learn more about um, the, the work of producing, and I should say art. Of producing <laughs> yeah. anything before. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is this was really, really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.